Today, we have special guest Whitney Tilson with us to share some wisdom of how to become a make money investor. Let's get started. I have former hedge fund manager, now editor at Stansbury Research, Whitney Tilson joining me today. He's going to discuss how investors can kind of turn themselves into something called a make money investor. Whitney, I'm excited to get this conversation started with you. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure, Lacey. All right, well, let's get right into it here. Uh, Whitney, I have seen you previously mention how you've made a profound shift in your own investing approach, kind of from traditional value investing to what you now describe as make money investing. Can you share a little bit with our viewers uh, what this means exactly for you and maybe what kind of uh, triggered this transition in your investment philosophy? Sure. Um, Well, look, I grew up um, at the feet of Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger. I like to say I pray in the church of Graham, Dodd, Buffett, and Munger. I've been to the last 26 Berkshire Hathaway annual meetings. I'm looking forward to going to the next one uh, coming up uh, first weekend in May every year. Uh, Unfortunately, this year without Charlie for the first time in many Mm -hmm. decades, uh, very sadly, uh, he was a real hero and mentor of mine. Uh, But so uh, as a value investor, uh, I look to buy cheap stocks. And uh, so what I did is, of course, I appreciated the the value of a good business that can compound over time. And uh, but I would say 75 percent of what I looked at was, you know, was a stock statistically cheap, some low multiple of earnings or cash flow or book value or liquidation value or something like that. Um, and then I would try and buy better businesses from among the cheap stocks I'd identified. Um, And uh, that I had it exactly backwards. I have now come to realize and there wasn't one trigger. It was just uh, a lot of experience and observation and where I made the most money over time was buying uh, better businesses even when I had to pay up for them. And, you know, shame on me. Warren Buffett learned this from Charlie Munger, you know, back in the early 1970s when he bought C's Candies, Mm -hmm. where, you know, had Charlie not been there. Uh, telling him, you know, don't be an idiot, um, you know, he probably wouldn't have bought it because it was, you know, priced at 5.6 times earnings and he wanted to buy it at 5.5 times earnings. And of course, C's Candy is a fabulous business and worth far more than either of those multiples. Um, so uh, so it was um, it was really, you know, that kind of experience. And, and so what I, uh, I still consider myself a value investor. Obviously, I only buy something Thing that I think it, I'm getting a bargain. I'm buying at a discount to intrinsic value. What has changed is, is that I've uh, developed a greater appreciation for uh, how valuable high quality businesses are that can grow and grow and compound over time. And that being willing that it's less important that how low a multiple I pay for it today and much more important how how much the business can grow over the next five or 10 years. And if it can grow at a healthy rate over that time, uh, over a long time period like that, it's worth a heck of a lot of money today. It almost, uh, I won't say it doesn't matter at all what price you pay, but the price you pay is a lot less important than uh, how the business performs over an extended period. Okay, so you kind of mentioned now that you place more emphasis on the quality of a business rather than the stock price. Um, So obviously, it's a little bit different depending on person to person. So I'm curious, um, can you tell us a little bit more about how you assess a company's quality? Like what specific metrics you prioritize with that? Secure your financial future with MarketBeat's exclusive report, Seven Stocks to Buy and Hold Forever. Dive into the insights of proven winners for income investors as our list reveals why these seven stocks boast very promising long-term outlooks. Don't miss out on the opportunity to grow your wealth with confidence. Download this free report today and start building a portfolio that stands the test of time. Yeah, well, I I don't think there's any real magic to it. Um, I'm looking for businesses that have wide moats, uh, strong competitive advantages that uh, both have growth prospects and uh, profitability metrics. They have high margins, generate lots of free cash flow, and very importantly, have uh, strong growth opportunities that aren't going to get competed away either by competitors or new technologies, et cetera. So um, I I can give a million examples, um, but they're all sort of obvious. Look at all the biggest companies in the world uh, that make up the top 20 companies in the S&P 500. Um, And the sad thing, I I will tell you, um, a corollary to buying high quality businesses is 
Um, the other big, big, big lesson that I learned too late in my career, um, but I, I'm still 57, I got, got many more years to go, I suppose, is you've got to let your winners run. You, it's not, uh, I owned Apple back in 2000 at a split adjusted 35 cents, but then it went up to 36 cents and had a bad quarter and I sold it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I owned uh, Home Depot, McDonald's, Netflix, Amazon, um, even more obscure companies. Uh, Ross Stores, who knew, has been a 75 bagger, not 75 percent, 75 times it's gone up in the last 20 years or so since I owned it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the other key thing to being a make money investor is is you've got to be able to identify quality companies that have a long growth runway. Uh, and some of that is looking at the numbers and all of that, but it's more also an assessment of being able to look into the future and understand how industries might change or very importantly, not change. Uh, you know, I remember 20 years ago, not buying Costco because Amazon was on the rise. The internet was the thing. And um, I failed to appreciate that Costco was still going to be able to thrive, Walmart as well, even in a world when people did more and more of their shopping online. There was room for, obviously Amazon was the play, mm -hmm. but you still could have made, so you could have made it 100 times or 200 times your money on Amazon, but you still would have made 10 times your money or 20 times your money owning incredible businesses then and incredible businesses today like Costco and Walmart. But the key is, is you had to be patient enough to sit there and hold it and let the miracle of compounding work for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So along with the company's quality though, sometimes investors do uh, tend to overstimulate future growth or sorry, overestimate. Um, we've seen this happen time and time again in the market. So how do you guard against this tendency in your own analysis, Whitney? You know, it's, it's a, it's an interesting, it's, it's a tough judgment call because, um, investors, I mean, every study ever done shows that investors, human beings in general, tend to project the immediate past indefinitely into the future. And of course, trees don't grow to the sky generally. Um, uh, there's there's powerful forces of reversion to the mean. Competitors do emerge, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so you do have to be careful not to get overly enthusiastic and overpay uh, for businesses either that even if they do continue to grow, um, that you just paid too much. And so you end up not making much money on the stock. But the much bigger mistake, of course, is, is thinking a business is somehow some great, incredible business, and it turns out not to be. And that's that's um, that's where you know there's some science, but I'd say there's more art than science in the investing business. It involves very, very difficult judgment calls of scanning, you know, 10 businesses a day, hundreds of businesses a month, and being able to very quickly reject ones either that are outside your circle of competence, you just don't understand them well enough to predict the future. Because that's really all investing is, is if I had a crystal ball right. and I knew what a company's earnings were going to be one year out or certainly five years out, you know, I'd be the richest man in the world, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's very, very difficult to predict the future, uh, but people who are very, very patient and they only wait till they get a fat pitch, you know, before they swing the bat. Um, so patience is a big part of it, but having that judgment and just understanding businesses and industries and competition, uh, uh, but also being able to judge management, that's another critical element. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, just yesterday, I was sitting with my friend, Bill Ackman. He was, uh, we we're up at Harvard Business School. And he was talking to a class of students and he talked about Chipotle, uh, which I have never owned, but he's owned it for a long time. And he came in and brought in a new CEO. The company, you may recall, had some um, some of its food had poisoned some of its customers um, and made them sick. And there was a, it was a big cleanup situation. It was almost like a turnaround. The stock had fallen. And he said, it was clear to me we need a new CEO. And I forget whether it was six, six years ago, it was many years ago. And he said, the only thing we did is we came in, we bought the stock and we pushed and got a new CEO in there. And then we've done absolutely nothing except sit on our butts. Um, and that CEO has fixed the problems and the company has grown tremendously. And Bill's probably made, I don't know, five to 10 times his money on his stock. Mm -hmm. um, 
Great insights there about that, Whitney. Thank you so much. Um, I want to get into something a little bit different now, um, kind of going along with this still, though. Is there a particular sector or trend that you're currently excited about? Um, and I want to know, of course, our viewers want to know, are there any companies within that that you believe are poised for uh, significant growth, maybe that align with your make money investing criteria? Sure. Um, I'll cite two general areas, and I'll give a couple stocks in the latter. Um, one is, is we're quite bullish on energy in general, oil, natural gas, um, old economy stuff. Um, we think there's a secular, we're in the midst of one of those every few decades, secular bull markets uh, in energy and have, um, uh, have a lot of favorites there. Um, and we're particularly bullish on nuclear energy. The world, particularly as a world, as we're going toward electric vehicles, um, which are taking off, you know, extremely rapidly. But uh, over the next, I believe the numbers, next 25 years, McKinsey estimates the um, U.S. energy demand is going to triple. And we're not going to be able to get all of it from wind and solar and hydroelectric. Um, it's going to have to come from uh, uh, oil and, and coal and hopefully more natural gas than coal, uh, but very importantly, nuclear. We're super bullish on the whole nuclear uh, energy sector and uh, have, a, have for some of our subscribers um, at Empire. Financial, I'm sorry, not at Empire Financial Research, at Stansbury Research. Um, formerly, I was heading up Empire. Um, we've got some uh, promotions out there, not promotions, but some, some of our paid newsletters. Uh, mm -hmm. We have specific recommendations there. One other theme I will mention is we've done a study of the stock exchanges uh, all around the world. And it turns out in every case we've been able to find, you know, Brazil and uh, not just the United States, but all around the world, um, owning the operator of the stock exchange, um, like the New York Stock Exchange, like NASDAQ, right? Mm -hmm. um, has th those stocks have done massively better than the underlying index, like the S&P 500 index. So in other words, owning the stock exchange has been a much better investment everywhere in the world than owning the stocks that trade on the exchange. And if you think about it, um, they're, they're beautiful businesses. They tend to be winner take all, because if you want to buy or sell a stock, you obviously need to be on the exchange where all the other buyers and sellers are. Um, and the businesses tend to do well during downturns, during times of volatility, because that's when investors trade more. Mm -hmm. And the, you know the stock exchanges don't care if the stocks are going up or down. They just care that there's a lot of trading. So uh, two of the stocks that I can share are sort of big cap stocks. Um, one is called uh, CME Group uh, that operates uh, options, uh, tr options contracts and so forth. It's a big company, has $78 billion markup. Um, it is not beaten down. It's not out of favor, but it is an incredible business uh, with mouthwatering economics. And I think people are going to be trading more stocks, not fewer stocks and more mm -hmm. options and futures, et cetera, um, five years from now, 10 years from now, uh, and that CME Group is still going to be sitting there minting money on all that trading. So another a uh, little bit smaller one that more focuses on futures is called CBOE Global Markets. The ticker is CBOE. The, the ticker for CME Group is, of course, CME. Um, and that's, uh, let's see, last time I looked, it's got a $19 billion market cap. So still a good size company. Um, both these are the kinds of stocks I never would have bought in my youth because they don't look statistically cheap. Mm -hmm. um, but now that I'm older and wiser and more of a make money investor, um, you know, I want a portfolio of super high quality businesses that I can hold for many years and compound nicely. And so um, I think CME Group and CBOE Global Markets are two good examples of that. All right, Whitney, leave us with this for a quick recap for our viewers looking to adopt a make money investing approach. What are the very first steps that you recommend? How do they begin to shift their mindset? Right. Well, by the way, first of all, before you even start investing, um, you know, sort sort out your, your life in general, um, get your career on track, uh, get into a healthy marriage that lasts. The single thing that will wreck your financial situation is a divorce. I can tell you that from a lot of observation. Thank goodness, not personal experience. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, make sure your income's going up every year. Even if, like my parents are teachers, uh, they have a very nice nest egg at age 82 and 83 years old because every year they both work their entire careers. 
They both made a little more money every year, uh, built nice careers, and very, very, very importantly, every single year of the 80-something years of their lives, they spent less than they earned. Um, so they were net savers, right? Mm -hmm. So that's by far actually more important than being the world's most brilliant investor, right? You, you need to, you know, you need to get, uh, you need to be saving every year. So you've got something to invest and then set aside a retirement plan, et cetera. Um, and by the way, the default should be um, have your employer withhold money from your paycheck every pay period. So you never see it. It goes straight into an IRA or a 403B or a 401K or whatever the retirement plan mm -hmm. is that you can access um, and have it automatically go into the S&P 500 index. Then at that point, take some of that money out and you can try and do better than the market with some stock picking. Um, and that's uh, so now I sort of get to your real question is, is OK, what are the keys there? Uh, the biggest keys are uh, think long term. You are not you, you are an investor, not a speculator, which means think about the value of businesses and where uh, businesses are going to be long into the future. Uh, you want to you want to have low portfolio turnover, um, only own, you know, 10 or at most 20 stocks. Uh, um, and don't trade them or churn them or whatever. Try and find high quality businesses that you understand that are just going to be worth more in five or 10 years. Uh, companies like Berkshire Hathaway is, I, I think, you know, the, the number one stock I always retire, uh, I always recommend for retirees or conservative investors. It'll do a little bit better than the S&P 500. You know, it's days of Warren Buffett, you know, beating the market by mm -hmm. light years are long gone. It's almost a trillion dollar market cap today, about 900 billion. Uh, but it still is somewhat undervalued, incredibly safe. Long, it'll be a lo nice long-term compounder, do a little bit better than the S&P 500 and, uh, and have reasonable expectations. Uh, it's not like there are tons of cheap stocks out there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, buy quality businesses and hold them for the long term. Well, thank you so much for sharing these valuable insights with us today. Whitney, where can people find you for more? Um, just go to stansberryresearch.com. That's where I'm an editor. And um, I publish a free investing daily that goes out to more than 100,000 people. Um, a, a little secret is, is, is I think it may be more valuable than some of our paid products and we give it away for free. So start there and you can start following me, you know, every day the market's open uh, around the middle of the day. I send, send out investing daily with my observations on the markets, my comment on stocks. And I always throw something in at the end about, you know, I travel a lot. Uh, I climb mountains. I run endurance races. Uh, I raise three daughters. Uh, you know, I health, fitness, sports, uh, travel. Uh, so I always throw something personal in there at the end. So um, if you just go to Stansbury Research um, and look for Whitney Tilson, you can sign up for my daily. Awesome. Well, I will go ahead and get Whitney's information linked down below. So go ahead and check that out. As always, Mark Beat will be right back here with more. But until next time, thanks so much for joining me today, Whitney. My pleasure, Lacey.